The Heli Cancer Jane Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast is always available online at HeliCancerJane.com. I have a question about this, and that is, did, did you feel that he saw himself as a man, or did he see himself as a black man? Well, that's a very, very interesting and good question. And I'm going to answer it in a way that I really believe he saw himself. I think he saw himself as a man that was equal to anyone else. Hmm. But he also saw himself as a black man. B.B. King once said that playing the blues was like having to be black twice. Most of us can only think we understand what he meant. One of those people who does know, his biographer, the creator of the positively genius documentary on the King of the Blues, the producer and director of the much-lauded American Masters, B.B. King, The Life of Riley, airing February 12th at 9 p.m. on your PBS stations. His name, John Brewer. Here on the Hallie Kasser Jane Show today to talk about the film, his friendship with Mr. King, and his iconic career managing some of the great rock and roll legends of our time, David Bowie, Mick Taylor, Bill Wyman, and Alvin Lee, to name but a few. Hi, and welcome. I am your host, Hallie Kasser Jane. John Brewer will be joining me at my table in just a moment. But first, the Hallie Kasser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by visiting my website at HallieCasserJane.com and clicking on the Audible.com icon for your free book. Hey, what's more fun than a free book? And remember, the Hallie Kesser Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues, including Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, the iHeartRadio Network, and Blog Talk Radio. You might not recognize his name, but you will be impressed by John Brewer's accomplishments. John grew up in London, where he was educated at Sutton Valley School for Boys, the son of an insurance broker and a housewife. He followed his father into the insurance industry at Lloyd's of London, but was soon drawn towards the music industry. It worked out rather well. For over 30 years, he's played a pivotal role in the careers of some of Rock's most legendary artists. Beginning his career in music management, Brewer quickly rose to the top of his profession and joined forces with then-up-and-coming artists such as David Bowie, Gene Clark of the Birds, Rolling Stones members Mick Taylor, Bill Wyman, and Alvin Lee, and 10 years after. And let's not forget, John Brewer was awarded the much-coveted Ivor Novella Award for Best Publisher and another for Best Song in 1979 for Jerry Rafferty's timeless hit, Baker Street, and another for the album, City to City, which seized the number one position in the Billboard charts and also top the charts in the UK and Europe. And that's just the beginning. In the early 1980s, Brewer entered the burgeoning video industry, creating the fourth largest independent production company in the UK, Avatar Film Company. As the producer of award-winning biopics, Brewer kicked off his directing career in 2005 and became a filmmaker to be reckoned with. Now, February 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern, American Masters airs his B.B. King, The Life of Riley, which tells the story of B.B. King, born Riley B. King, one of the most influential and celebrated blues musicians of all time. From his roots as a sharecropper's son, working in the cotton fields of Mississippi, to his rise to living legend, the most renowned blues singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer of the past 40 years, featuring interviews with Bono, Eric Clapton, John Mayer, Carlos Santana, Ringo Starr, and more, and narrated by Morgan Freeman. Let's talk. 
John, are you kidding? Listen to me, John. What what a career you've had. I mean, you you were going to be an insurance agent. <laughs> you become the yeah. life of the music industry. Are, are you are you in any way astonished by all the things that have happened to you? This really has been a remarkable career. Well, I'm I'm amazed, really, because when 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 we left school, we basically either went into the city or you went into a trade. And there wasn't a music business trade. And um, I'm not saying I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but my father was quite successful in insurance at Lloyd's. And I left school and went into Lloyd's. And I was very successful in the first year, but hated it all. But then I basically... Um, because I'd sort of been influenced by Jimi Hendrix whilst I was at school, because I met him, and I had the privilege of meeting him, and um, I said, that's what I want to do. And I started frequenting the clubs, which is called the Speakeasy in London, and what happened was the Speakeasy was a club for whether you were a musician, a roadie, a record company a and whatever it was, Everybody was the same. And uh, that lasted every night to four in the morning, except for Sundays. And I met some of the greatest people that anyone could ever want to meet. And I left there and basically went into management. And suddenly all the ideas of any other job left my mind because it was an unbankable business. You couldn't raise funding for it. And you were literally out there with a T-shirt shirt rather than a, a dress shirt. And you basically had a pair of jeans on and you made it work. Yeah, how old were you then? 21, 1971, when I took over the management with Tony DeFries and David Bowie. That's 1971. And then yeah. I also represented Bill Wyman for the Stones because that happened to lead me into the Stones situation. And I, of course, represented Mick Taylor. And the next thing that happened is that I'm off running. So, you know, came over to America, of course, realized that I became known as the man with the suitcase of, in those days, seven and a half inch tape <laughs> okay and most of the a and men didn't know how to feed the seven and a half inch tapes on their revoxes so i had to do it for them and um thank god for uh little cassette tapes because it made life a lot in easier and you could get away with a lot more because it was so bad reproduction anyway um right. but then um you know that i used to have a suitcase that i used to come over with Full of bands and full of them. I used to go around all the record companies, got to know everybody from Clive Davis to Walter Yetnikoff to all of these fantastic people. But, you know, you were as good as what you carried. You were like a, a door-to-door salesman. And that's how Bowie got his record deal. I mean, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> but... Um, and the, and the, what they said to me was, John, we got enough problems selling records with guys in trousers, let alone dresses. And <laughs> you had to find an answer to come back at them with. Well, try that <laughs> one for size. <laughs> I love it. But here's so, a question you know, I have to ask you, um, because because it is it, it it is quite some story. But but I'm fascinated by this. You know, most of us interviewer types you know we'll ask a musician you know like what 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 is it about music that gets your your juices going for you talk to me about that clearly you've got a business head like nobody's business come on i mean you are like the ace but there, there was a connection to music that you must have found or not yeah there was the timing was on my side so you had experimental situations there were free festivals they're what, what they call free festivals. Was, we call them lovings over here. Yeah, here too. Always, <laughs> always satisfied the young sort of guy who was young. And I mean, I went to my first love, and I, I thought I really took their clothes off and ran around the field, you know, which wasn't quite the case, but some of it was. <laughs> but it was really the music. And having become friendly with Jimmy, and then of course I worked with Noel Redding, and and you know, with also with the Stones, with the with with Bowie, and all of this. It's what went through you, through, it sort of penetrates you and then sort of comes out the other side. And, you know, I loved to hear live music. And in those days, and in fact, it's coming back a bit, and um, vinyl was like, we didn't know anything about anything else. We used to put the record on and listen to it. And in those days, you could listen to a side of a record, an LP, and turn it over. Now, try that. <laughs> Size. It takes you, oh, the phone goes, you run across the alley, you've never listened to two or three of the tracks. And that's all been robbed of us. But the music thing really affected me. 
I used to play a bit of guitar too. You know, Mick Jagger influenced me and I always thought I could dance better than Jagger. You know, there were things like that. But at the end of the day, it was a culture. And that culture took me away with it. And it got better and better. But I have to say that I'm bringing this up because I think this goes to what we're about to discuss with this new film of yours on B.B. King. Because I think... You so understand the culture of music. It shows in this film. There's B.B. King, but there's also You Understood a Culture, and, and we'll get to that in a second. But let's talk about the fact that you did work with the late David Bowie and Gene Clark of The Birds and, and The Stones, Heller and Bill Wyman and Alan Lee, and 10 years after, and were you having any fun? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you were. Alvin well, Alvin Lee, it was, I, I loved the man dearly. And Alvin Lee was an icon in America. Didn't mean anything in the UK, but in, and it was 10 years after it was an English band. But Woodstock broke Alvin. And then he was always worried about me not understanding America and, and said to me, but you, do you understand America? And I go, Alvin, look, you know, if you want somebody else to handle you in America, then find somebody else. Well, he said, well, a lot of people, a lot of bands had an English manager or European manager and had American manager and he had D'Antoni at one stage who had Humble Pie and, and various other bands and I went why can't I do it and he went yeah well you know America's different and you know it was a, a completely different situation and I just went out to America with him and I can remember sort of uh, moving offices and reducing the staff and saying I'm off for six months and I went out there and I I toured with him like manager, road manager, uh, you know, confidant. And we ripped the whole of America up. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And, you know, we were playing 20,000, 30,000 seaters. And they just went nuts with him. And he was very much somebody who loved FM radio and couldn't stand AM. So, you know, he didn't like doing interviews. And if he ever did interviews, he wanted to meet the jocks that used to live in trailers and, and run their radio station from trailers and things. And, of course, that changed because they'd become suits. He couldn't understand that. Because he wore the same clothes practically for every gig that he ever did. <laughs> I mean, you know, I remember the old flared jeans and the clogs and the basses. But what a guitarist and what an inc a man knew how to milk an audience. You were awarded the much-coveted Yvonne Novello Award for Best Publisher and another for Best Song in 1979 for Jerry Rafferty's Timeless Hit, one of mm. my favorites ever, Baker Street, another for the album City to City, which went to the number one position on Billboard charts and also topped the charts in the UK and Europe. I, I need to mention all of that because I think this is all prelude to the brilliance you've just created in this new film, American Masters, B.B. King, The Life of Riley. But I, I think that you have to say, as I was reviewing your career, John, it's so clear to me how you one led to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other that you were able to produce such a phenomenal documentary. We just lost Bowie, so I do want to hear your thoughts on, on him before we go into the film. As you've probably read, now in the middle of making Beside Bowie, which was the story of Mick Ronson, who was the most fantastic arranger and really an unsung hero, not because of David, but he was just a bloke from Hull and he loved his pack of cigarettes and he loved his spear and he loved his guitar and he was the most easiest person to satisfy. But he actually really did play a marvellous part in David Bowie's career and we might never have had David Bowie as we know David without him. So there's a film being put together now which I'm doing and it's brought back all the stories and all the time that I spent with David. I was really brought in by Tony DeFries and Lawrence Myers. Lawrence was the money man, Tony was the legal man, and uh, to sort of handle the artist and nobody could talk to David because he had a list of 14 people he would talk to. Not because he felt only 14 people were worthy of being talked to. He was really shy and you had to get through to him. I mean, he'd talk to you, but he wouldn't, you know, have a conversation with you. And so it was building David's career and he thought the artist was needed to be creative and all the management didn't understand anything about creativity which in a way was like very difficult for me to handle because I said look I, I've got to be involved in that because I like to know what you're going to do so when he cut his hair which was beautifully long hair all the way down his back because of man who sold the world and fitted in the dress outfit that he was wearing you know Everybody was shocked at the offices, and I ran into the corridor and said, look, guys, what's the problem? He said, have you seen what David's done to his hair? 
said, it looks great. And nobody could understand what I was saying, but David understood because David understood that I was slightly more creative than the business side. And so I started saying, you know, talking about Suffragette City and talking about that track didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to, but it's not to give up. And of course he didn't, he didn't put it on the next album after Hunky Dory. And I possibly played too much of a part in that. I was responsible for the Friars gig at Aylesbury in England, which is the gig that he suddenly came up the stairs looking like Ziggy Stardust. And I looked at him and I said, nice outfit, David. <laughs> and everybody was, couldn't say anything because they, they thought he was a folk singer, you know, that sat down with an acoustic guitar. They knew with the spiders, they knew with Mick Ronson behind him it was going to be a rock show. They had no idea that this guy was going to come out looking like he did. And it was made up. And he was, of course, an actor, Lindsay Kemp. He was a wonderful mime artist. And he basically knew that he had to play a part. And he, what he did was play a part. He's probably one of the few geniuses I've ever known. He was always two steps uh, in front. And just now, of course, with his death and passing, you see how in control he was for the next. Oh, act. yeah. Right. Phenomenal, so, right? Yes, and and I I smile every time I think about it, and every time I listen to the new album, I go, it was a almost a military m maneuver to the last second, and I just you know quite honestly was so amazed with David over the years, but always I look at him as not in in the way of business. I always looked at him and saying, what's he going to do now? He's got something up his sleeve. This is about you, because I think what I discovered in in really getting to, you know, background on you. There are a lot of business managers. There are a lot of managers. Each of them take their little role and then they do it. And you have a very strong left and right brain, apparently, because you're the artist and you're also the manager. And that's a, a, a brilliant combination, which, by the way, let's get to B.B. King, <laughs> shows up. This is poetry. I'm not joking. I, I was very moved by this. Mm. The, here's the thing that I, I want to know. First of all, were you totally into B.B. King? How did this thing even come to pass? How did you get on this one? This seems like a little bit of a departure for you in a way. Well, in the early 70s, I had a partner in business who used to go on and on about the blues. And I go, well, isn't that rock, blues, rock, blues? What, what, what's so great about just the blues? And I was sort of educated somewhat by him, and, and he sort of said, you've got to listen to this. And listen to Long John Baldry and Rod Stewart. You know, influence comes from the blues. And I'm listening to all these wonderful artists, and I go, oh, yeah, I can see that now. I can hear that. And we were surrounded by blues artists. And when you talk to Mick Taylor, when he joined the, the Stones, he was a, 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 and always will remain a blues guitarist. And so I got to know, and Albert Lee was a blues guitarist. I mean, you know, he was a little bit faster than most blues guitarists, but he was... So I understood the blues to a certain extent. I have to tell you that I interviewed B.B. at the Montreux Festival because I was doing a, a documentary on Cream with Eric Clapton, and I wanted to know from an outsider's point of view what Eric was like to work with. And B.B. gave me probably one of the worst interviews of my life. <laughs> and he just kept saying, what a charming, charming man and what a charming player and what a charming man. And, and I kept going, oh, OK. Well, if I got two lines out of him, it was a lot. But there I was with this great guy backstage at the Montreux Festival who had no, even to the day he died, he had no idea about film and sound because the noise was coming from the stage and it was like a drone coming through. And I'm going to say, well, we, we need to move somewhere with this. And he had no idea idea so he just continued and you don't really tell bb king when and what to do so i did this interview and it was quite amazing and he, he sort of in full tuxedo said solomon burke was there and he came in and thank god he came in because he broke the sort of uncomfortableness of the whole situation and he was so funny and then bb relaxed and then BB let go. So I felt more divine having talked to him than 10 minutes before when I felt sort of, what is this guy? What's so special about him? Well, I learned because he was very, very experienced and he was also very kind and devoted to what the business is. So I went away. Five years later, I'm in New York and I get a phone call and I phone them back and it's his manager. His manager is a lady that worked with Sid 
uh, who died, uh, who was BB's manager and turned him around. And, and she said, uh, can I meet with you? Because I've got a problem and I want to talk to you. And I met with her and she said, look, and one of the few people that ever called me an angel. And she said, I think you're an angel that's come down to earth. And I said, why? She said, because I've got four different offers and I've suddenly decided I want you to make the documentary. Now, I was very flattered. And but I thought, well, how many documentaries has he made? She said, he's never made one. And I went... It's impossible. 83, 45 years of age. And she said, no, he's never done it. And we need to do it. And I went, okay. And I kept saying, okay. And I kept saying, okay. And at the same time I was doing that, I was going back round and round in my mind. Do I want to do this? Should I be doing this? And then I suddenly went, no, I should be doing this. And it was from that moment onwards that I'd made that decision and it was on. <laughs> then I get a call through saying, BB's been asked if it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, 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 and I went, what? <laughs> I said, have you just told him that? And they said, well, sort of, because if you tell BB too far up front, he won't remember it anyway. Oh, so I gosh. went, okay. So I met with B at Glastonbury. He was very nervous because he thought he was, his audience was quite young out there and he didn't think he was going to go and they were heckling not heckling in the nice in a in a nice way just shouting out bb 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 and eventually he heard and just a big smile came over his face and i'll never forget that smile because he came off stage and threw his arms around me he didn't actually know me for very long you know in any way and i um went back to his trailer and i sat with him and i then told him that i was going to film him at the royal albert hall which actually was the last Royal Albert Hall, last show he ever did in the UK. And um, I almost took over the running of that gig. I had remote cameras, 12 cameras up there as well. And I was under the stage and, you know, we had guests like Ronnie Wood, Mick Hucknall, Slash. Various people I had invited, which wasn't the usual crowd, although I had asked Eric and he said yes, but he got stuck at Naples Airport. But we had, uh, you know, Derek uh, Trucks and uh, his wife and um, lots of what I call good, good musicians, nice musicians. And so um, Susan Tateshi, uh, and it was a wonderful concert. And there are so many stories that I can tell you, but B, um, B was right on, but he, he liked it his way. And I suddenly realized that I had to make a very special film. So having had that experience and getting to know B, I then went to work. And I learned so much by going down south to Indianola and Memphis about real blues. And I was interviewing men that basically are no longer with us and women as well. That, and I, I, under, I could understand, I sat on the old plantations, sat where his house used to be, I sat where his mother was buried, I sat at the, outside the school he was brought up in. And I understood the fear that went through them and the fear of the lynchings and the various things, although that's been gone for some time. He kept bringing me back saying, it's still here. Yeah. And I'm going, it can't be here. And he said, it is here. And you don't understand because you weren't born in the South. And I went, okay. But he says, you can't do anything about it because you also weren't born in the South and you have to be born in the South to understand it. And I went, okay. So I went to work and every door flew open. I cannot tell you, I didn't even have to make the phone calls to do the interviews. And from a President Obama down to John Mayle to Ringo Starr to Eric Clapton to Santana to everyone that took part in that film. And you've got a shorter version, but there's a hell of a lot more of them. It's a yes, wonderful, no. <laughs> wonderful film. But you look at these people coming through the door saying, can I take part in this? Yeah. That that brings me to something I want to talk to you about because there is the issue of you're the Brit and and Bibi's story is the ultimate Southern Americana racist story. He came from a generation before things got a little better and he went through the transition and he kind of saw where we were going with it. I don't think we've arrived in America yet at complete freedom for the black man, particularly in the South. But well, we but haven't. here's what I was so impressed with with you, what your work was. I have to tell you this: you you so captured the tone. I spent a lot of time in the South. I live in the South. You know, I I know that world. How you did that, being and forgive me, it's not a slur on being a Brit. 
it's a, it's just that really the the mark of a phenomenal filmmaker if you can create that tone and and get that tone because we knew BB King's world from once he came and understood how he became who he became because of the of this really and it was it was a work of art it, it really it really was a work of art from the music to everything it was just amazing but uh, you know his well, story you. uh, you're welcome his story from the beginning I mean you know born in in the small town in Mississippi, which is really where the Ku Klux Klan began. Seven years old, he's picking cotton. Uh, you know, mother leaves, and I just want to tell the audience a little bit of this. Mother leaves and, and says, you know, you're on your own with your grandmother. And then the grandmother dies. He goes to live with a father who uh, was, what, in Memphis. And so, therefore, you know, that was a whole other world he's introduced to. He saw a lynching as a kid, understood the role of the black man. Here's something that I picked up and tell me, talk to me about. This man seemed to have, for all his shtick, and he had a lot of stuff going on in his life, such a warm soul. Is that is that what you got? That he was a, a moral man and he fought the you know morality demons we all have, that he was but he was moral, he was kind and he was driven. And I want to talk to about that drive. But was that what you picked up, good man? BB King had God on his side. If ever a man had God on his side, <laughs> BB did. Yeah. And I have to tell you that he was a devout man without being somebody that would push his view over onto you, mm-hmm. but you knew as soon as you sat down with him that you were sitting with someone that was divine and yeah. had divine powers. He saved my life. Really? How so? He said, he said that he recognized that he thought I had diabetes, which you know, I had to promise him I'd have to go and set that, and I did. And I um, managed to get rid of that diabetes and we won't wow. go into that, but virtually I lost, well, 65 pounds in about four months and managed to get rid of diabetes. He tried for 20 years, but DBB, he said, I'm too old. When you get over 65, you know, start trying to lose a bit of weight, but you, you can't, my size, start losing it. There's a problem. And I, he said, I stopped eating lots of sugar and stuff and everything else, but, you know, it's misery. And, and uh, so don't get to that stage, John, and, you know, then try and do it. And, yeah, I used to sit down with him and talk to him, and it took me two years to get his trust, you know. Wow, that's, that's an interesting awesome. situation. Yeah. It wasn't that he ran away or he hid under the table or, you know, turned his back. He was very cagey in what he said to me and what he responded. And eventually, the beginning of the interviews, it was the pat answers that came out. And I kept saying, you know, I don't understand that. What about this? What about that? And it wasn't one lynching he saw. He saw so many lynchings. But this happened to be a man or a boy that he knew. And there are many, many, many stories he told me. I couldn't understand this because I've been brought up in a country which is completely different from that type of atmosphere. So I've seen racism in this country. I saw it many years ago. And I was astonished and astounded that someone could be the same nationality as myself and could say such dreadful things and take such dreadful actions. And so I understood a little bit about it. But when you go down south, as you well know, you know that there's a lot more visible there and you can read between the lines if you so want to. And it's a so want to, which, of course, is pushed to the one side and saying, hey, you know, we, we have different churches. The reason we have different churches, is black people worship in different ways and white people are different. And I'm going, I only thought there was one God and <laughs> it didn't matter whether he was black or white. So, but they practice it and they say they're not racist by doing it. And, you know, it's still there in the South. And B told me that. And I could see him getting more and more angry. Now, most people will tell you that B.B. King never got angry, but he did. I've seen him shout. I've seen him get cross. I've seen him get really stern. At what? What did, was he, what did he get? tiny him? little things that might have upset him. And I'm going, well, you know, I've been with rock and roll bands that have thrown things out of windows of hotels and TV sets. And everybody can try and explain why they did it. Yes, they've been on the road too long and they're basically going out of their mind. And they're basically being destructful. But, you know, it's like they're being picked up, taken to a hotel room, dropped up, picked up, put on an airplane, picked up, turned around. And before you know what's happened, the more successful they get, the more of a recluse they become in their own hotel rooms. Well, B.B. loved it. B.B. 
would love to be in his hotel room. It had to be at 80 degrees. And every suite that he had, every hotel provided him with the greatest accommodation. And he had his things that he wanted and everything else and his television and everything that of comfort. But then he suddenly said, mm, I want to do something different. I want to, but he couldn't because he's BB King. So he used to get a bit grumpy. And, you know, one of the things that annoyed him most, which of course has now come to the surface, was the fact is that he had 15 children from 15 different women. And he always said to me, I said, how do you know that your your children? I mean, you know, lots of people may, he said, if a, <laughs> I share a bed with a woman and a woman tells me that's my child, I, I respect her so much that she shared the bed with me that I wouldn't disagree that that wasn't my child and I would provide schooling for that child all the way through. So I went, oh, that's great. But, you know, that's a lot of kids you have to take care of. And you see, what annoyed him was the families used to, because those those people are much older and they wouldn't go to gigs and stuff. And then the daughters of the, the cousins and the cousins of the, what would be standing by the bus with their hands out. And he said, look, I'll give them envelopes, but not very much because... You know, I'm into thousands and thousands and thousands. And I don't understand why they keep basically begging monies off me. Now, I said to him, well, you started this. You created that. He said, well, I meant to be kind. So I said, okay, fine. And now, of course, as soon as he was dying, I mean, he'd been dying for some time, but, you know, the family starts fighting because they all thought they were going to be multimillionaires, all of them. And what happened was that he left all the money to the education of the grandchildren and their their children. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course they went up in arms but that was like that was him saying I know you're going to all fight I know it's all going to be hell but what's going to happen is that little generation that's really going to need it way down the line is going to get it and Unbelievable. that's how he thought yeah that's how yeah. he thought we'll be back in a minute but first you are listening to the Halle Kesser Jane Show my guest today is John Brewer producer and writer and director of the documentary American Masters B.B. King, The Life of Riley, airing February 12th, 9 p.m. Eastern on PBS. Check your local listings. He didn't fail at much in life. His marriage didn't work. He was completely devoted to being on the road all the time and playing his music. The music was his, his, his wife, his mistress, if you will. But he really meant it. Uh, some people say that, and they'll sit on their bed and they'll play their guitar for hours. And he was an old guy at the time, and he's already still on the road doing 300 gigs. But I want to talk a little bit about the fact that, and this this was something I thought was interesting that came out in the film, and that is he, he went the route. He made it in the black world. He did the Chitlin Circuit, breaking through until getting a white audience particularly at the time. I think Sammy Davis Jr. was one of the few people who, who really did that. He did it, but it came late in life. And it came because of somebody you started to talk about who had been, what, his accountant who became his manager, who also, I think, was a bit of a genius, Sydney, yeah, Sydney Seidenberg. But it took a while for him to, to get to that wide audience. What I love, though, and this is what I want, where I wanted to go with that is, just when you define that blues thing, stay with me on this one, John. I always think that the rhythm of the life in the Mississippi Delta kind of syncs with the way the music comes out. And, you know, when you would listen to a BB, any, any song that he sang, it was like, he, I know he called his guitar playing twangy, but there was something in the songs that was, I don't know, I think of a porch swing swinging, and you could hear that in the music. Or, or a fan twirling lazy in the ceiling, beating off the high humidity. The South was so in his music more than any artist that I can think of. Do you agree? Yes, I do. And, you know, he worked the fields when he was a very young man and also went to school. And the death of his mother shook him terribly. He also basically, when his grandmother died, which wasn't long after that, he basically uh, stayed in the, the hut that he'd lived in for something like two to three years as a child. Now, this is the one thing that completely freaked me out and completely got me to, to go out there and literally roll around in, in the dirt to find that feeling. He talked to animals. And when you think about all his friends, were out there but at night when they'd gone to a warm house had a meal cooked for them he had to make his own and he talked to wild animals he talked to rabbits and mice and various things he talked to me about it and he said he learned so much 
And, of course, he probably didn't get many of them to disagree with him because, you know, he probably actually <laughs> held court. And that's why everybody used to say, but he talks a lot during his shows. I said, so would you if you only had a rabbit to talk to. But, you know, at the end of the day, his father came. His school teacher was the man that he respected more than anybody else. And there were lots of questions that hadn't been answered. They didn't know what diabetes was then, why his mother had died of diabetes, which she did. He didn't really understand why all this was happening. He went to stay with his father who had remarried and basically had brought up children and they were stepbrothers and sisters to him but he he didn't get on with them all that easy and it was a bigger place and it wasn't a little school and so he took a bicycle and rode all the way back home which was about 120 miles, 50 miles. It's a long way mm-hmm. and extraordinary. He came back and he just wanted to work in the fields and his cousins and everything were still around but most of his friends had disappeared from school there were still some I met a few of them and he was able to say well you know I'm a great tractor driver and he learned how to ride a tractor and drive a tractor and he became really good at it but there was still the fear of the white man and there was still the fear in the blood I think Buddy Guy is probably one of the last musicians that really up there that we know had the same sort of parents that lived in that time when slavery had been abolished, but only just. And their life that they went into was just the same as slavery uh, because they still got beat. They were given credit at a store on the plantation and they worked their credit off. So actually, it's the same thing, really. Didn't have any more rights than they had before uh, slavery was abolished. So at the end of the day, you had to gain their trust. And one thing that I learned was when I was down there, I nearly passed out behind the camera. I literally had to get in the car, air conditioning on with a a loudspeaker, so yelling out directions to get the shoot going because I was so hot. So I could hardly breathe. That's how <laughs> how it got to me. And we were drinking. I never drank so much water in my life. But the situation was that I could feel it. I could feel it rising. I could see the heat rising from the ground. I tried yeah. to get capture that on camera. And I think we did on the railroad track. Yeah, I'm yeah. going, I'm going, how can, if I stood here long enough, somebody, I've got a train hit me. I mean, you know, there's no protection. What about children that run up and down on bicycles? It's not that far away from what it was. And there's the guy, when you walk into the bar and you look around and there's no white people in there. And they look at you as if, oh, hang on a sec, who are you? And you feel very uncomfortable because you feel, oh, they're looking at my skin color. And you start thinking about that and you go, that's exactly how they must have felt. And, you know, the whole thing was to understand that. Of course, the atrocities we are reminded about, there's museums and you read stories and you go down to see the places and you understand how dreadful it must have been. But, hey, you know, that's civilization growing up. I mean, you know, we're still doing dreadful things to people now that you think, how can a man do that? Bury somebody in the desert and try and ransom them for money. I mean, you know, it's happening out there. Oh, for sure. to, to, To see that you know, I, I must tell you this, that I, I, he wanted me to film that his funeral. And I went, right. well, be there. And no one's ever asked me to do that. And I went out there when he died and I saw uh, uh, what three, four, five thousand people turn out and walk down through Memphis, literally in tears, but in joy and tears. And then I went, rushed up to the state border and saw the different police change over so that he went into Indianola. And that's when it hit me and I shed a tear. I've got to admit because he's going home for the last time because whenever he came into Mississippi he always had the police meet him and then have a helicopter and bikes and cars like officially uh, escort him through and he was like an icon like a king of, of Mississippi and when he got down to Indianola I turned up first thing in the morning at 8.30 and there was not a soul on the street. And I went, where, where, where is everybody? It's like it, suddenly there'd been a, some dreadful bomb had gone off and everybody had run to hide. I said, I don't understand. And I turned onto BB King Road and there they were, stretching for miles down the road, waiting in line to walk past his casket. They'd all come out. Yeah. There was nobody yeah. at home. You know, I just, um, I was, I, I just found that whole situation like amazing. 
And, well, that um, sensitivity that you're talking about now, John, shows up in the film. I think that's what I've been trying to say over and over and over again, and which is maybe why I was so extraordinarily moved by it. I, I have a question about this, and that is, did did you feel that he saw himself as a man, or did he see himself as a black man? Well, that's a very, very interesting and good question. And I'm going to answer it in a way that I really believe he saw himself. I think he saw himself as a man that was equal to anyone else. Hmm. But he also saw himself as a black man. Yeah. Because he knew that there was the time and place. And when you start talking about the Chitlin Circus, do you know, he said, I don't know what that means. And I went, well, the Chitlin Circus was the best. Oh, no, he said, I, I've never thought of it that way. And so it says it the same thing. Do you think of yourself as a black man or do you think of yourself as a man? I thought of myself as a man. You know, because people put titles on things and everything else, that doesn't necessarily mean, right, there should be a title given. And I don't think there should be. I don't see the difference between a white man or a black man or a black man and a white man. There are good black men and good white men and bad black men and bad white men. And, you know, the man is, you can describe the man as being a man, but... As far as I'm concerned, you're equal. And he experienced education whereby he was told he is not equal. And the way that has been attacked over the years, at the day that he was at school, they made examples of black men that had gone out there and have become sportsmen, worldwide known athletes or whatever it was, to encourage those children to get away from what they had been told. You gotta keep your mouth to yourself. Basically because if you don't, you're gonna get into trouble and they'll kill you. So basically, that's what he he said to me. He said, I couldn't believe that this teacher of mine kept telling me how successful I was going to be. And he proved everybody right. Well, it's a marvelous you... thing to, to, to be able to achieve. Well, absolutely. You know, particularly this. He said he never heard his father say, I love you. Yes. yes. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, how astonishing, how sad. He filled himself up, though, apparently, with his music, right? Music was his own form of self-love. He had well, to have made it. B.B. didn't like being heckled. B.B. didn't like being booed. B.B. didn't like a concert to go wrong. B.B. hated bad reviews, things like that, because he really wanted everyone to be happy. And his whole idea was, I want to give them this music that makes them happy. And that's the old theory about blues. Is everybody thinks, oh, it's sad. And one, it's a language. And secondly, it's been played by musicians, not for pity. It's been played by musicians to make people happy. And he always thought that. That's why when he did a performance, he would always make reference to somebody in the audience or whatever it was. He said, you enjoyed that, didn't you? That makes me happy. That's why there's this piece in the film, which I kept in for the shortened version that goes out on PBS, which is basically, you know, all I want is for people to play B.B. King music all around the world. And it was because he enjoyed people and seeing them happy. And that's exactly where B.B. King was at. But he also, right, had to live a life. And now that B.B. King has passed, you know, it'll never be the same, but life has to go on. And so many musicians now are coming through because of B.B. King. And when you think of it, they say, oh, blues isn't the most important music on in, in America. And you go, well, it's part of it. And as far as I'm concerned, whether it's jazz, blues, rock and roll, or, or rap music, it all springs somewhere from people like B.B. King. Absolutely. Who interpreted what they knew and interpreted the language for the others to learn. I'm glad that you said that that way because here's something. You named some of the people who contribute to this film. Of course, um, the voiceover for the main part of the film is Morgan Freeman. who, What a perfect yes. narrator. You couldn't have picked anybody better. But then you have people... He, he didn't very, agree with that. He didn't know why he was being picked, but there you go. you got to be kidding. <laughs> Come on. No, he didn't know B very well. He didn't know B. The King very well, but he respected him so much. And the very little thing that I've just told you, Morgan Freeman is somebody that believes that people should... You could see in Morgan Freeman's acting. He does it to please. 
And whether he's got his own problems in his life or whatever it is, you never see that in one of those films. You don't right, see yeah. him. You're... You only see him playing that wonderful part that he's been given, and he plays it so well. You know, it's the same thing with B. B couldn't play a chord. I mean, he could play a chord, but he could hate he putting two chords together. Mm -hmm. And he didn't play chord. I mean, that's it. He played guitar. And he could, on that that whole way of style that he played, which was unique to him, which in many, many interviews he tried to explain and nobody could understand a word he was talking about, the vibrato that he created, he'd sort of developed that himself. And somehow, because of the blood that went round his veins and his body, it was his soul that came out on the note that he played. That's what made him such an icon to Eric Clapton, to the John Mayles, to the... Uh, uh, Carlos Santana, other people, Bonnie you Ray. Know, all, all of those people. Santana, what a wonderful thing to say. You know, the expressions, he could tell him, he could tell it was B.B. King without the sound on because he right. could just see his expressions on his face and he could tell you what he was playing. Well, you can. If you look at the expressions on his face, he almost takes you up to the note that he's playing. But it was unique. It was individual. And well, I'm gonna, uh, can I bring he, this up? Uh, let me bring this up in, 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 because you just brought it up, and I want to I throw this out to you. He was talking about the way he maneuvered his fingers, the sound that he was able to get. And he, he said, you know, he had to move his fingers a certain way. And then he said mm. this, John. And this interested me. He said, now this is an old man saying this. He's been playing music since he was a little kid, right? And he says, I, I still don't have it right. <laughs> yeah, no. How hard was he on well, himself? Yeah, well, no, he, uh, I, I, I know what that means. You see. No, I do know what, what that means. What he did was yeah. he improvised. But no one can improvise what he improvised. Because That's his improvisation right. was something that he created himself to cut corners because he couldn't quite get what he wanted to do. You know, when he went to Memphis, Booker White, his cousin, said, you should play like this, and he couldn't get it. And then he watched other musicians, and he said, they're so much better than I am. And then he went away, and he came back, and he came back very much better musician than he basically originally arrived the first time in Memphis. And he still didn't, he, he improvised what Booker White was showed him and he did it his own way and it became B.B. King. But it was yeah. the connection, not the physical movement. It was the connection of his soul, the thing that was inside him. And that's what Santana tries to explain. He said that came from his soul, his inside, that when he hit that note, it was so brilliant, and it may have been wrong in the eyes of Booker White and the style that he did it, but you know it came from the soul. Now, I could go out and play that and improvise it, and it would mean nothing, but that he goes out and does it, you're almost joining the, the, the waves in the air. It's like something that you <gasps> takes your breath away, and that's what <laughs> Eric Clapton says. That's what, I mean, Eric's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant musician, and he went, I, I, I couldn't do that. I can't do that. I can imitate it, but I can't get it from my soul. I have to play this is from my soul, my way. And that's why I always get very suspicious of people that try to compare musicians. Real true musicians do what they do. And basically, well, you know, it's the way they do it makes right. it and connects with their inner soul. And he had a lot of highs, and he had certainly his equal lows. I mean, the IRS was after him at one point. He had two divorces. I mean, the, he named his guitar Lucille. I think that was his real wife. His revered touring bus was stolen at one point, and then another bus was in a horrible accident, and two people were killed in a fiery crash. I mean, he was uh, he you know, destitute. Because there was no insurance, and so he was in debt for years trying to pay that off. Here's my point. I think all of these things that happened to him, from the from the highs to the lows, to everything. He was like raw meat. He never put the defenses up when he played the music that you do see a lot of great musicians put up, even though they're great. Maybe that's what you're talking about, about the fact that he was able to take it from the from well, the head to the, to the machine of the, of the guitar to the world. He was raw, well, defenseless. I don't think it had to do with the instrument as an individual instrument and him as a guitar player. 
Right. I think it was the combination of the instrument and him making that instrument tell the story of what he was trying to say and the way he played it. Now, as a filmmaker, I can tell you that there are certain tricks that I use to get you glued and to play with your emotions. And the timing, which timing is very important. And I basically can, can do the same thing in portraying with camera or a picture what you, what he was doing through his instrument. I'm not nearly as a master as he is, but I can tell you that it was a combination. He basically was B.B. King and he was king of the blues. And every musician will say that to you. He was king of the blues. And he could play the blues to a modern audience, a much younger audience. And he crossed it over from a black audience that he was only limited to play in the 50s to, to a white audience. So with the help of musicians, some of them are from, from the United States, but the majority were from England and the UK. And when you say, how does a Brit get involved in this? Well, Brits have been involved in the sort of development of B.B. King's career for a long time. And we literally, as Keith Richard said, we were astonished how they played and how they managed to put those songs together and how they develop songs and how they take other people's songs and turn them into blues. And, you know, that's what the basis of some of the greatest rock bands in the world has based their music on. He's divine. He was a man that managed to make incredible music, which gave the breath of air and gave birth to many, many, many great bands and musicians and music. That's why he was the king of the blues. You, but you uh, know, I was the last person to touch the coffin as it went down. Oh, was that true? And I said a big yeah. thank you, a big thank you. And as it went down, I smiled because he'd succeeded to the last second of bringing happiness certainly to my little family because their father's going to live a lot longer because of him. <laughs> and I've got to tell you that there were people all around me going, don't cry. It's the greatest performance of his life. And it was. I'm not saying it was the greatest audience in his life because there were a lot of people right. fighting even at the last right. second, but it was the greatest performance. I have to tell you, and, and I don't know whether you understand this, but when he designed his own funeral based on two white horses in a line. The two white horses came in front of the carriage, the hearse, and behind came this wonderful black, beautiful horse carrying Lucille. And he was to come all the way down from the chapel to B.B. King Road, go all along B.B. King Road and to the graveside, which was land that he had bought. And he'd put it, the museum, B.B. King Museum, on that. And he was to, he didn't want to be in a graveyard. He didn't like graveyards. And as the, the horses turned into the main road, the most incredible wind and noise came down that road. And if that wasn't the Holy Spirit, I don't know what was. Mm. And the horses went up rearing and they had to calm them all down and bring the horses down to the edge of the T-junction to carry on. And the camera flew off its stand. I caught the cameraman and the camera because we were elevated. And the other cameraman was the other side. He was hit by things. It was just like a wind that came down that road. And then there was peace, absolute calm peace. And that moved me more than anything else because I knew BB's done it. He's on the way home. In 1984, B.B. King was inducted into the Blues Foundation Hall of Fame. In 1987, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and received a Lifetime Achievement Grammy Award. He was awarded the National Medal of Arts and in 1995 received the Kennedy Center Honors. President George W. Bush presented King with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. We lost him on May 14, 2015 when he passed away at the age of 89. Music was B.B. King's wife until the very end. February 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern, John Brewer's documentary, American Masters, B.B. King, The Life of Riley, premieres on your PBS station. Check your local listings. Hi, this is Hallie Kasser jane Did you enjoy the show? I hope so. And I hope that you'll tell your friends about it and help us grow our family. How can you help? That's easy. Share the link to the show with your friends or my show's player. 
And I would love it even more if you'd recommend they visit my website at HallieKesserJane.com. I look forward to seeing all of you there. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Caster Jane Show. The Hallie Caster Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Caster Jane Show and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasterJane.com. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Caster Jane Show, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Caster Jane Show. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasterJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Caster Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is. Hallie Caster Jane. It's a.